post. It can be said that one of the truly least desired reunions is one for a co-worker who has passed away. It was that sad duty that I returned to the Windy City and pay my respects to the late Ronald J. Updike. It was a large affair. He amassed quite a following when he took over for the Society of Fashion page at the Chicago Sun-Times. I met his spouse at the service. He knew my name. Either Ron lied to him, or he was a very cordial liar himself, saying that Ron had thought the best of him. Gerard seemed to be taking it well. There had been rumors about Ron, but nobody ever treated him bad or different. We already had reasons to be annoyed with him. Ron was the first person to publicly come out at the paper, revealing a courage no one knew he had. I saw Monique. Her time in INS was brief. She wasn't mad at me with what happened to her uncle, Abe Marmelstein, the smiling cobra. She thanked me for advice that had changed her life for the better. Advice I didn't even remember. On a run to the Russo shootout, I told her things could get a little rough out there, maybe even dangerous. It did, and she ran right out into the line of fire, nearly getting herself killed. I threw her into my trunk for safety. At first, she wanted to kill me, something her uncle could arrange. But later, it helped her realize risking her life or others was not what she wanted to do with her life. Her brief time working around me convinced her people like me needed counseling with their destructive habits and obsessions. She went back to Columbia, got a degree in psychology, and later turned her practice into an impressive social media self-help site. She owed it all to me and my trunk, and offered to help me with any depression or mental issues I may be fighting. I was touched, but I knew if I ever opened up to anyone about the things that I've seen, I'd get moved into a rubber room hotel fast. While milling around at the wake, I heard that timeless voice behind me. Hello, Carl. It was Tony. Tony! I turn around to see that expression on the face of Anthony Vincenzo, an expression of both nostalgia and regret for where our conversations will usually go. Although I hope no shouting will happen here. I said, Hello, Tony. Glad to see you could get away from your busy high-rise office in D.C. I'm the boss, Carl. And I can set my own schedule. Besides, Ron was a good man. He certainly earned my respect. You did too, Carl. Just that, you know, the way things went down. Yes, things went down. For me. You see, Tony was the hero. He won all the accolades. He went on to work in a big media job covering all the political scandals and such in our nation's capital, thanks to my story. No thanks, really. Sure, he sends me the odd tip from time to time, uses some pull to get me out of trouble here and there. But given my pension for trouble, records with the government, and how so many in the business just don't like me, there was no way he or any in a respectable news group or InfoWars could hire me. It's why I had to go solo, set up my own site, sources, and connect up with the fringe groups, mostly outcasts like myself. At this point, I'll take you back 15 years to the glory days and what happened that brought the end of our friendship. Mid-February usually means chilly winds, flurries, and slush to the city from the lake. But it was different this time, as it was unseasonably warm. 
I had been working on a story that seemed right up my alley. Reports of a man-sized winged creature lurking on rooftops, swooping down chasing cars at night, and flybys scaring the elevated train commuters. Witnesses say it has no head, but large, glowing red eyes and shag-like fur all over it. Tony was not impressed, saying that it's a hoax and it's just some guy in a costume. So I countered with, Halloween is coming up, Tony. So it is appropriate news. My car was in the shop, so I was already taking the trains, when I was lucky to spot and get a couple of pictures of what people were seeing. But I got all too close of you, as it strafed me before it took off. Something made me a desirable target or something. So I take the L on my way back to the service, hoping the pictures I took will turn out good, when I hear a voice behind me say, You had your camera on the wrong speed setting, Mr. Kolchak. What? I turned, and I saw a somewhat large, broad-shouldered man with a ridiculous grin on his face, staring at me. He repeated, You had your camera on the wrong speed, Mr. Kolchak. I looked at my camera. Damn! It was set to lower light and speed. Another blurry mess. I glared at Mr. Smiley and said, How did you know? And how do you know who I am? You could say I'm a very observant man, Mr. Kolchak. I've seen you before. You always pop up covering the big stories, so your fame precedes you. Hmm. Apart from irritated police chiefs and money-hungry sources, I'm surprised anyone knows me by my trade. Oh, well, thanks for the tip and I turned to contemplate what excuse for Tony I was going to have to give when I turned this in. Why are you on this train? Will this be your story? He was still there, still smiling at me, creepy-like. I thought we were done. No, just catching a ride since my car's dead. It allows me to mingle with the normal people. I said with my own weird smile right back at him. Oh, I thought you would be working on the story of an elevated train wreck. Train wreck? What train wreck? Had I missed one heck of a story, not using the police radio in my car? The one, I believe, caused by the drunken train operator. Have I been scooped? This nut already knows what and why. Must have already hit on the radio stations. Where? Which line? When did it happen? That must be why I was curious, Mr. Kolchak. You see, it's this line. This operator. It just hasn't happened yet. Hasn't? What? Are you trying to be funny? Making up a story like that? No, Mr. Kolchak. Tragedies like that seem very serious events. Not funny at all. I often wonder why such events aren't preventable considering that it's already known what is to come. Oh, so you know something. Who are you? Some informant looking to sell me info? No, Mr. Kolchak. I'm not interested in your money. But I do know things you do not. I just wish to share some knowledge, to see how it is used, and if it makes a difference. As for who I am, my name is Indrid. Indrid Cole. Have you ever met someone who gives you the creeps, but you don't instinctively run away from them? Then you've met someone just like this man, Indrid Cold, 
Well, what are you trying to tell me, Mr. Cold? I said as I reared up, feigning giving him my full attention. Just then, as I demonstrated, I observe things more than most here, and that the operator of this train enjoys his drinks as much as often as he works. When those two intersect, there will be calamity, unless someone comes between them. So, are you a co-worker, his barkeep, or some psychic? I really meant to say psycho. I'm afraid not, Mr. Coljack. You see, I'm not really from around here, just a tourist. But I encountered him enjoying strong refreshments before he started his shift on the train, and nobody seems concerned with the safety of such actions. So I thought I would share it with you, an investigator, to see if you can stop the inevitable from happening. Definitely a psycho. Oh, you saw him drinking and think he's too drunk to operate the train. Well, that may be something I'll look into. Sounds pretty solid, all right. It might be worth taking the wrong stop just to get away from this nut. Actually, this is where I exit Mr. Kolchak, at the State Lake Street platform. While it still stops for it, I wouldn't want to miss the show. Oh, darn. And it was just getting interesting. So long. I'll try to give you a better answers the next time we meet. For now, I can only tell you that the operator's name is Martin Steffen. And it's not his first time, either. The train had stopped at his platform. He rose and sauntered out the door like he was examining a new car. I was happy to be out of that weirdo socializing. Tourist. He looked more like a well-dressed doorman from one of those moony cults. I'll keep plenty of distance between him and me if I see him coming. I went back to thinking of my own dilemma, but it was hard to clear all that spooky stuff from my mind. At my stop, I went out the front exit, giving the operator a look, just for curiosity. Looked fine, couldn't smell anything on him. But his name badge did say, Martin Steffen. I stepped down from the platform, crossed the street, went inside, up the stairs, and into the stuffy offices of the Independent News Service. Seeing the bullpen of usual suspects, I said, Reading, slaves! Hoping they could use the laugh. Ron just gave me a smile, busy working on his own piece of society dribble. Miss Emily said, Hello, Carl. I took a couple of calls for you. More reports of seeing that bird man. No, Emily. Mothman. Mothman. Thank you, dear. Just leave them on my desk. I've got to go do some developing first. Thirty minutes later, and smelly chemicals produced images that would make Bigfoot proud. Another thirty spent typing up a story that I'll have to make up for the pictures. But I got interrupted when my then boss, Anthony Vincenzo, decided... It was time to see what I had. Hello, Carl. So, what do you have for me today? Something pertinent? Newsworthy? Something we can send out? Before I can say, it's not ready yet, he pulls it and begins reading. Oh, Carl. This stuff again? Commuters were nearly attacked by a winged creature buzzing the L train earlier. What? They hit the bars early today? No, Tony. I saw it and took pictures of it. Pictures? Let me see. Well, they didn't develop very well. Let me see. I handed them over. He looked through the three glossies and then started laughing like a madman. Ha 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 ha! Cold Jack! I've seen better pictures on a Rorschach test! No, this is not a story. But Tony, I... Cold Jack, you better have a story or you're going to look like these pictures when I'm done with you. Well, I may have a story about an un unsafe train operator. Possible union issue. L train operator. Really? 
What's the source, Carl? Oh, I, I'm still doing the legwork on that while I was covering on this story. As of right now, you are working on this and this alone. You hear me, Carl? I want something on my desk tomorrow, either that story or your head. I looked at him and said, You know, Tony, I love it how your yelling brings out the blue in your eyes. Out! Well, now I've done it. Caught flat-footed by Tony, I blundered out the only thing I could think of. Now I have to try and find a story from a kook on a train. So I started asking around, checking official records from prior incidents on his route, insurance claims, other operators. Item, there is no more secret an organization, short of the CIA, than a city transportation union. And while they and their union were impenetrable to my inquiries, it seemed the Chicago Transit Authority was not. And for the right bribe, members of the CTA would sing like they were on the radio. It turns out that Stefan has had several safety violations in the last four years. Things like reading while operating, distracted talking to customers, even leading him to slow roll into another train once. And while I couldn't get anything in writing, he also failed two random drug alcohol tests. Normally, that would cost him his city license, but nothing happened with him. Why? There may actually be a story here. But not about Rex, but corruption. As the sun was setting, I decided to head back to the office and start writing a proof of the story to show Vincenzo he's getting his money's worth. On my way to the L, I was crossed by a shadow overhead, and I heard loud flapping sounds. I looked up just in time to see one of those things swoop into a dark alley. I quickly ran around the corner, fumbling with my camera, this time making sure the settings were right. Looking around, I can no longer see the Mothman, but I see Guy Smiley, our friend, Mr. Cold. He was exiting the shop, turning away from me, walking down and around another corner, out of sight. That was close, I thought. Then again, he did say next time he'd have more answers for me. Maybe he works for the insurance company. Is that how he knew about Stefan's priors? I need to know more about him. And what he knows. Darn it. So I started off in his direction down the street. As I walked in front of the shop he came from, I could see a strange blue glowing light coming from inside. Curiosity got to me, so I looked and opened the door. Inside was a large glowing blue object, about eight feet tall and as long as a truck. I could hear a low humming sound, and the air around it felt slightly charged, and on the front it looked like there was some access door. It was darker, but I could put my hand through it. So I walked inside. It felt cooler, like it was air-conditioned or something. Once I fully entered the blue box, the inside was somehow larger, and it all lit up. I could see energy coursing through the walls of whatever it was. It wasn't so much of a room as it was a hallway without any objects or markings at all. At the other end was another translucent access doorway, this time a lighter color. Again, my hand felt nothing when I stuck it in. So I held my breath and walked through. When I came through the other side, it was... I was amazed. I was someplace, somewhere else, Really, I was standing on the edge of a violet-colored cliff, overlooking a valley of strange buildings, shapes, and features. The cliff sides were sprinkled with glowing blue gems that twinkled as if they were a marquee light. The sky was a dark blue, 
full of constellations, meteorites, a huge moon at one horizon, and a ringed planet that covered a quarter of the other. The thing I walked through was the same and still behind me, but it was the only recognizable thing that I saw. Instinctively, I started taking pictures of everything. Even the air itself tasted like cotton candy. Carl, you are no longer on Earth. Quite correct, Mr. Kolchak, yet also very wrong as well. I turned around, and with that voice came the entrance of Mr. Indrid Cold from the access way. You see, this is not your Earth, it is mine. Welcome to Lanyulos. Out stepped Indrid Cold, but he looks very different. His face was bleached white, and his hair a bright green. I said, your face. It's... Yes, Mr. Kolchak. You are seeing its true appearance now that you're on my world instead of yours. The colors you see are expanded some in my atmosphere. Stunned, I uttered. So, I'm on another planet? No. It's the same planet. You're merely experiencing it from fourth space. You live in third space. When you stare at a picture, you can see it in two dimensions, where things in the picture would not be able to see you. Likewise, here in fourth space, we can see you on Earth, where you cannot see the things here in Lanulos, even though they coexist. My head was reeling with all the things hitting me at once. So this is... Another dimension? I, I don't see anything of Earth here. More a higher plane of existence, actually. Your mind and senses aren't from this plane, so it's beyond your abilities to see as we do here. We see things bleed through into force space, depending on how much it negatively affects Earthlings mentally, through psychic pain and suffering. See that glowing place up there? He pointed to a glowing orb about 20 feet in the air. He told me that it's being caused by a tragedy in third... Uh, on my Earth. That my senses lack the ability to see more than the glow. So he handed me something like a magnifying glass to look at it. Suddenly, I could see an L train pushing another off the tracks crashing down on cars on the street below it. The horrible scene then went back and forth in a loop. Cold said that that was temporal refraction, like when you stare through a pool of water. Here, they can see things of us as before, then, and after. They see in time as well as space. While he tried to explain this, a translucent figure appeared near the train image. It swirled around, becoming solid. A mothman! It circled again and then disappeared into the image. What was that? I questioned Cold as he had a sheepish look on his face. That, I'm afraid, was a denizen of fifth space. You call a mothman. They are attracted to and feed upon psychic pain, as you would say, a moth drawn to a flame. We don't know much about them, and they scare us as much as they do you. Frustrated, I just lost it with him. I don't get it. Why show me all this? What's your business in doing this? Bugging me and filling my head with this stuff. Answer me, Cold. Well, Mr. Kolchak, I'm a scientist. 
I study your world and its ways. I've seen you before and other tragedies and chose to do an experiment. By giving you insight into what will happen, I'll see if things change from our perspective. As he was telling me this, he guided me to go back into his dimensional elevator. Back inside, I said it doesn't make sense since I saw the event still happening out there. He walked to the other end, turned and said, Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. You see, while you were on Lanulos, you were not affecting the course of time on Earth. I will be able to check the difference once I return you, which I will do after taking this back. Cole took the lens thing out of my hand, and with a fluid motion, spun and tossed me out the other side. On the ground, I heard Cole tell me, Good luck, Mr. Kolchak. I hope you are able to make a difference for the better. Oh, and do be careful with those mothmen. They may be able to sense your experience in Lanulos now, and may want to make a closer inspection of you. And with that, the big blue thing just winked out of existence leaving me laying there, questioning my own. It took a moment to get my bearings and decide what to do. Outside, the sun was down. How much time had passed? I got up and made my way back to work, this time taking a cab, because I don't know when and where the wreck actually happens. Before he said, this line, this operator, that was the Lake Dan Ryan train. I raced back to INS and typed up my story, and it was a whopper. For obvious reasons, I couldn't divulge Mr. Cold his origin, or the light show he gave me. Worse was both the camera film and tape recordings were blank, another obvious effect of being in another dimension. All I had to go on was the off-the-record reports of the operator, Stefan's drug test fails, and prior incidents, and how it's being covered up with its potential for calamity. If I could get the ball rolling on an investigation, that might be enough to get him pulled from work and save lives. I typed through most of the night and left it on Tony's desk and planned to come in first thing in the morning to go over it with him. I was more tired than I thought and ended up oversleeping, getting in late. When I entered, I was surprised with Tony holding court with none other than Amalgamated Transit Union Chief himself, Cyrus Buke. I was quickly pulled in to defend my article. Where did I get the details? And do I know what kind of harm and damage such yellow journalism would do? Before I could return fire, Vincenzo calmed both of us down and wanted to speak to me alone for a moment. Buke said it's fine, and asked to use the phone. In Tony's office, he explained that my story was too light. It needed more corroboration of what I had. So he invited Buke to come in and give his side of the story, trying to dispute what we had. In doing this, Vincenzo hoped to either trip him up, admitting to something we didn't have, or get him on record refusing to comment proving he is hiding something. So far, all he'd done is ask what the story was about, then attack us for trying to scare people with unfounded rumors. By the time we came back out of the office, Buke had left, telling Ron that his business here was finished. I told Tony I'll type up an addition with Buke's comments. Tony went to answer his phone. Ten minutes later, I had the piece ready as Vincenzo came out of his office. I had ignored the yelling, followed by the silence, because 
I had been on the other end of that phone enough times. This time, I should have paid attention. Here it is, Tony. With all the spit and polish, it'll get plenty of coverage. I'm sorry, Carl. The story's been pulled. What? Don't try to pull that on me again! No, Carl. This comes from higher up. The story is officially dead. Tony, we can't kill this story. If that guy's allowed to... Kolchak! Carl. Marblestein himself killed the story. I think we both know who Cyrus Butte called now. But why would the smiling Cobra stop a huge story for his own news service? What would he have to gain? Vincenzo looked worried, confused. He obviously was not himself, because he told me to go ahead and work on my Mothman story instead. I told him that's for later. I've got to try and stop a train. I grabbed my hat and made for the door. This was the one time Tony didn't yell to stop me. It was the first time. And the last time. After I left, Tony went back to his office and then made a call. Hello. I'd like to speak to the managing editor, Ted Jameson. Tell him it's Tony Vincenzo. We're old friends. Hey, Ted. Yes, it's been a while. No, I was thinking about lunch today. Ted, I've got a story that's just too big for me to release. So I was hoping you'd do me a favor. The day was spent by me frantically trying to prevent Stefan from operating that train. From the station command to going to his house, Everywhere I went, either I was thrown out for being a kook, or I'd missed him. But it was when I tried to get on that train, is when it happened. Cold was right. I had drawn the attention of the Mothman. They must also know I was trying to prevent the disaster, and I guess they see it as me coming between them at a juicy meal. As I went to approach the steps to the platform on Lake Street, the creature swooped and dived to get me. I had to turn and run down an alley, but it was no good. It scooped me up, taking me up into the sky, and deposited me on top of a skyscraper's roof. It took hours until someone heard my banging on a door to let me in. By that time, it was too late. The derailment had happened. On the loop at Wabash Avenue and Lake Street during the evening rush hour. Stefan's train rear-ended another on the northeast corner of the Lake Diane Ryan. He struck the back of the Ravensburg train. His impact was at 10 miles per hour, slow, but it didn't stop, and it pushed the other train, forcing its cars to derail. The first four cars of the rear train fell off the elevated tracks, killing 11 people and injuring at least 260 as the cars fell onto the street below. All I could do was try to help, stay out of the way, and try to get testimonials of the people there. After the tragedy, things started to accelerate around me. The only thing bigger than that story was the investigation into why it happened. Part of that was spurred by a piece from a Chicago Sun-Times editorial on a cover-up of insurance incidents by CTA operators. It strangely had the look of my story. Meanwhile, INS fired me. The reason given was making up details of a story because I couldn't list the sources who can see into the future. 
and they had a file inches thick of previous articles rejected but held to use against me. The level they went to make it known blackballed me from ever getting another job in the business, apart from the occasional stints with the Weekly World News. But the Sun's investigation brought out answers. It turns out the medical partner responsible for the Union's coverage, treatments, and testing was a major investment by one Ed Marmelstein, owner of Independent News Service. I should have guessed when it was part of our medical provider as well. It turns out that the White Knight who led in the testimony of Marmelstein's cover-up was none other than Vincenzo. After Ed told him to kill the story, he told someone at the Times what he knew, and they ran with it. Tony went with his heart and became the hero, while I became persona non grata. Marmelstein was buried, first in a pile of lawsuits, and then literally when his little heart gave out. INS went out of business, not being profitable enough in the changing age of the news industry, with everything going cable news and video clips. Ron hired on at the Times and did well. Miss Emily moved to Pismo Beach to live with her daughter and finish her book. I never heard if it sold well or anything else about her. And Tony moved up into the big leagues, of course. Which brings us to today. We talked for a bit more, but it just wasn't like old times. We could never get that back. He offered to get me a meal at Manny's, but I said I wanted to get an early start, heading out to Des Moines on a report of someone dressed as a scarecrow attacking people. It was funny. When I left INS, I thought I was the last straw man. He just gave me a sad look and nodded. We had been through many years, many stories, many arguments. In the end, we both gave in and accepted what my life was going to be. An endless search to uncover dark truths that most will not believe, but will be thwarted by yours truly, The Night Stalker.